Welcome to Community Church, and thanks so much for tuning in online. We hope that you enjoy today's message and are encouraged through your time here today. No matter who you are or what's going on in your life, know that we are so glad you're here. Community Church, how you guys doing? So excited to see what God's doing. You guys can have a seat. Well, my name is Sam, one of the pastors here at Community Church. So excited to be sharing with you here today. Believe, I already believe in God's doing something already in this house, and I believe over the next few minutes we have together, he's just going to continue to do what he's already started here tonight on Monday night. Uh, we've been in this series called Faves, and it's been a lot of fun over the last few weeks. We've had different communicators each week just talking about some different things. We've rotated some campuses. Pastor Michael was at our Kinsville campus this weekend. Pastor Megan was at our Suffolk campus. And I get to wrap up the Fave series right here at Western Branch with the Monday Night Crew. So I'm really, really excited about that because I love Monday Night Services so much, so much fun. And it's been cool as we're going over this series, Faves, because it's so much fun to just talk about favorite things. So easy to talk about maybe favorite TV shows you have, favorite movies that you like, favorite music that you listen to, what your favorite food may be. That's the conversation. I'll join you any day. Favorite foods is the easy one for me. Then I think about, like, when I think about favorites, one that I think about a lot is sports. I love sports, playing sports, watching sports, coaching sports, just love being involved with it. And then when you think about favorite sports, you almost can't help but think about favorite sport teams. How many of you have a favorite sport team? Maybe of whatever sport it may be, you just have a favorite team. And then football season comes around, and here's what happens. Either you find out you have friends you didn't know about or people you didn't like that you didn't even know because of what your favorite team may be. So here's what we're going to do tonight about our favorite teams. I'm not going to tell you what mine are. And I don't want to know what yours are, because here's what's going to happen. It's a very possible I'll tell you my favorite team, and you'll just get and walk out and say, I can't listen to another word that guy says. Or you'll tell me your favorite team, and I'm going to feel just like I have to pray for you the rest of the night because of what your team may be. So we're just going to agree we all have the best team and move on. But here's what I think we can all agree on right now, the Monday night coming in, the heat waves hitting. How many of your favorite is air conditioning? Well, I love some air conditioning. Come on, right? That's something we can all agree on and get on the same page about, but we've been doing this fave series, it's a lot of fun, and uh, what we've been talking about really each week is what times you'll hear a communicator say something like a refrigerator verse or, or a tattoo verse, and basically what we're talking about is a favorite passage or a verse that really stands out to us in some way that helps us just continue to live out the life that God would have for us. And as I was getting ready for this series, I just know my favorite verse has been my favorite verse for a long time now, even though I have many verses and passages that I love to go back to. Uh, but this is a particular one. That here's what I'll tell you why it's my favorite verse. Because whatever I may go through in life, whatever may come my way, I know I can always come back to this verse and it's gonna help me keep moving forward into what God would have for my life. And so here's what I would tell you. Whatever favorite verse you may have or if you don't have one, I absolutely believe with everything in me that this is a verse that if we would understand the truth that God has shown us in it, would be helpful for each and every one of us during the most difficult times of our life. And so I would say, maybe you put it on your refrigerator, maybe you get it tattooed, wherever you gotta do, so you remember this verse, but get it in your heart, because God wants to use it in the times when you need it most. And so I wanna share with you my verse. It comes out of Psalm chapter 46. And I wanna share with you a little bit of Psalm 46. Here's a few of the things that lead up to this verse. It says, earths may quake, mountains may crumble, oceans will roar, governments and kingdoms will fall. So far, it's very encouraging. And we're all excited to hear this favorite verse. And then it goes on to Psalm 46.10, which is my favorite verse. It says, be still and know that I am God. Yes. I want everybody to say, be still. be still. Now hold on to those two words. We're going to talk about that. Because in this passage, in this verse, we hear this, maybe you've heard this a lot. It's been seen, written on a lot of things. A lot of people like this, be still, know that I'm God, part of this chapter. And most people consider this to be this moment where God says, hey, when everything's kind of going crazy, when the world and life seems chaotic, just stop. Just settle down mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and just kind of remove all the distractions in your life and focus in on who I am. And what I would tell you is that is an incredible thing to do. And every one of us should have that worked into the rhythm of our life each and every day. But it's not actually what this verse is talking about. He says, when the world seems chaotic and everything seems like it's falling apart, he doesn't say just stop what you're doing and think about who I am. He's actually saying something much deeper than that, although that should be something we do Regularly, And before I get into what be still actually means and what God is showing us in this chapter, I want to give you some reasons why we need to know how important this is. Because I did some research, just over the last couple of years, I'm always researching different things. And one thing I've seen a few times now from different research companies is that they're looking at stuff in our society and our culture. And that we've been kind of diagnosed as a society today 
as the most depressed culture in the history of civilizations. That the amount of anxiety and stress and depression is higher than it's ever been in any known civilization in history. And we go, wow, what's going on with that? So we're going to face a lot of things, and we are facing a lot of things in our life that's going to say we're going to get to a place where we're going to feel like maybe the world is falling apart around us and it feels a little chaotic. What do we do in those moments? And we see that our culture does so much to add that pressure and our stress on us. And if we look at everything around us, we could try to do what everybody else does, but what everybody else does isn't working. <laughs> or we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. In fact, Romans 12, 2, it says this. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Man, I love that last part, that I can know God's will for my life. And God's will for my life is good and it's pleasing, and it's a perfect will for my life. And if I would just focus on what God wants for my life, I'd probably experience more of what he has for me. Unfortunately, most of us spend time focusing on what the world says is important about life, and we miss out on God's will. And we find ourselves in this situation where we're unfulfilled, and we're stressed out, and we're looking for something more, because it's not God's will. We see that, that uh, there's a lot of things in our lives and in humanity that, that cause a lot of distress. Most of it actually comes from ourselves. The Bible talks about it in 1 John chapter 2, 15 and 16. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, points out three very specific things right here. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. The customs and behavior of this world are, are, the, pride, are the lust of flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of life. What, what the Bible is teaching, what God is showing us right now, is we're going to live in a life where we have these natural desires for physical pleasure, the lust of the flesh, whatever feels good, physical pleasure. And we know in our culture, there are so many ways now that our culture is saying, here's how you can get physical pleasure any way you want it, anytime you need it, in all kinds of ways. And we seek after that. It says the lust of the eyes. We're in a culture where we're constantly told to go after all these shiny, pretty things. We should own and possess all this stuff because we have to have it all. And then it's the pride of life, this money and success and, and this drive for achievement to find value in who we are. And you look at our lives and you go, this is the way we're living. If this is the world we're in, and I'm living by, these, by the lust of my flesh and the lust of my eyes and desires and the pride of life. No wonder I'm going to get to a place where I'm just stressed out and anxious about life. That is never enough. And then you add on top of this all the things that happen in life that you have no control over that just come your way. And it's easy to see why we could be so stressed out and anxious and depressed in life. And we start to experience a little bit about what Psalm 46 talks about. It seems like everything's just coming at us and the world's just kind of falling apart and we're living amidst chaos. And so what does God say? He enters in and he says, be still and know that I'm God in those moments. So what is he, what is he teaching us? What does be still mean? And you look in the original language, what be still means, it's not about physically stopping what you're doing. Be still actually means to let go and release. It says to let go and release. God is saying that when the world seems chaotic around you, that doesn't mean to stop what you're doing and freeze. It means let go and release. Well, let go and release of what? How does that even make sense? Here's what he's telling us. Let go and release your own understanding, your own wisdom, your own ability, your own power, and your own strength, and know that I'm God, and whatever wisdom, power, ability, and strength you need, I have it. He says, when the world feels like it's chaotic and it's falling apart, guess what? You have to let go of thinking you can do something about this and trust that I can. Yeah. And until you do, you'll stay in that situation because you're not capable on your own. That's what be still, know that I am God means. And here's the thing for all of us, every single one of us sitting here right here tonight, everybody listening online right now, we, we have this desire for a life of fulfillment. God has put in us, God has given us a purpose in life. And if we're not following his will, which is good and pleasing and perfect, if we're not living in that, then we're constantly looking for what is my life meant to be? We all want our life to have significance and to mean something, and we're searching for that. But what happens is the customs and behaviors of this world get in the way of what God's will for our life would be. But we want it and we desire it. So how do we get there? How do we experience more of what God would want for us and not just be like the rest of the world around us? If you're taking notes on you can write this down. Here's how I'm saying it this weekend. We have to learn to let go if you want to be able to grab on. 
If you want to be able to grab onto the life that God has for you, and God's life is good and pleasing and perfect, his will for you is that. If you want to grab onto that life, experiencing all that God had in mind for you when he created you, you have to learn to let go of all your own understanding and your thinking and your ways of life and what the world says is best for you and trust God more. That's what be still and know that I'm God is really about. It's about trusting God more than yourself because here's our two options in life. You think you know what's best for you or you believe God knows what's best for you. And at some point, you gotta make a decision. Either I believe I know what's best for my life or I believe God knows what's best for my life and who am I gonna listen to? And when you think about what you know, you already know how much you know. So let's talk a little about what God knows. Here's, here's some understanding of who God is, the creator of all things, the knower of all things. Jeremiah 10, 12, it says this, it is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. Isaiah 40, 28 says, have you not known, have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. I read just these two verses about God and I go, should I trust me about my life or should I trust God about my life? And I'm a pretty simple guy and I go, I think I should trust God because if he can just stretch out the heavens because he thought it was a good idea, I can swing my arm out here all day long. Heavens ain't going to come out nowhere right? I'm just not capable of what he is. His wisdom, his understanding is unsearchable. Mine is so limited. Ask my wife, my wisdom is so limited, <laughs> but God's is unsearchable. And yet I have this decision to make. Am I going to trust God with my life or am I going to trust myself or others with my life? And when I'm going through a season or a moment where it seems like chaotic and everything is just turned upside down and it's not going at all the way I thought it would go, do I really believe that me or someone around me has enough wisdom to help me through this? Or do I believe that the God of the universe could show me which path to take and give me the strength that I need? Because every one of us have a plan for our life. Doesn't matter where you're at in stage of life right now. Maybe you're a student in the room. Maybe you're retired in the room. You have plans for your life. You have things that you want to accomplish still, things that you want to do tomorrow and the days ahead and the, the months and the years to come. There's things that you want to accomplish with your life. You have plans for your life. And as I was getting ready for this series, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he reminded me of a quote from a great philosopher that really kind of stood out to me. And here's, here's what he said. This great philosopher, Mike Tyson. Here's what he said. And you can, you can imagine it in his voice, however you would like. <laughs> Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. That's so true. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And then what? When your plan goes sideways, when it turns upside down, when it doesn't turn out the way you thought it would, when it doesn't go the direction you expected it to go, when you seem to lose control of what you thought was going to happen, then what? Well, God says, be still. <laughs> Let go of your own plan and your own way of thinking and trust that I know what's best for your life. I want to give you a couple examples for my life, that just early on as I started following Jesus, how God's really just done some things in my life to help increase my faith so much to help me get through other things that I faced in days beyond this. But early on, as a, as a young adult and a young married couple, my wife and I, very young and, and in the corporate America and working, we have a little baby girl and, and just life is good. We're, we're going to church. We're, we're, we're following Jesus. We're both have jobs that are by all intensive purposes or whatever you may call it, are successful. We both came from backgrounds where, where money was always an issue for our families. We never had all the things our friends had. We moved from place to place. Uh, very similar backgrounds of, of not always having enough and money being an issue in our family's lives. Then now here we are. We're both in corporate America making great salaries, buying homes and cars. I have a, have a beautiful little girl. We're going to a church that we love. We're following Jesus. We're like, this is what it's all about. She's up for promotion. I'm up for promotion. Things are going really well. And my plan at this point is I'm just going to keep following Jesus and I'm just going to keep getting promoted and I'm just going to keep making more money. And as long as it goes great, this is going to be awesome. And that was my plan. Until I started listening to God's will for my life, starting to hear what he would have to say. And I learned over some time and praying and talking with my wife and others that, that corporate America wasn't the plan that God had for me. And he was calling me to do something a little different. He's like, I, I want you to be in, in ministry where you're just, you're just sharing my love and my hope with people all the time, helping them understand who I am and what I can be in their life. And so my wife and I start having conversations about what does that look like 
for our family. And I realized I need to go to school. I need to go to seminary, Bible college. I need to get some foundation and some education to maybe go and do what God's called me to do. And so I'm trying to figure out how to make all this work. And I got this, this corporate job that I love and I'm working all these hours and I got a, a new wife and a new kid and, and, and I'm, school is over here. So I got to figure this out and I, I can't figure it out. So I make this decision, my wife and I, that I'm going to step down from the position I'm in and take a different role at my company so that I can start going to school at night and on the weekends, which sounds great, other than the stepping down from this role means I was going to lose about 75% of my salary <laughs> by stepping out of this. Now, I don't know how much money you make, and I think it's insignificant how much you make. 75% of what you make is a whole lot of money, <laughs> right? That's the significant chunk of whatever it is you're making. And we said, this is what we think we're supposed to do. And somehow, those voices in my own head and the ones around me, the customs and behaviors of this world, all my friends are like, man, you're up for promotion. You're going to like double your salary in a few months and you're going to step down from what you're doing? Why would you do this? And I'm like, I never had money before. It's kind of nice to be able to go buy whatever I want to whenever I want to. And so about two weeks before I was supposed to make this change, I go back to my boss and say, you know what, I don't, I, you know, there's some other things I want to do, but I'm a smart guy and I'm pretty sure I can figure out how to keep doing this job and get promoted and still do what God's called me to do. So I'm going to stay in the position I'm in and I'm, I still want the promotion when that time comes. And he's like, great, we'd love to see you stay. So I stay in the job. Two months later goes by, and I'm still not, I have no idea how I'm going to do school. I'm trying to figure it out. There's just no time for it. It's not going to happen. So that's on the back burner somewhere. God, I'll get to that when it works for me. And then I go to work one day, and I make a couple of decisions that didn't go the best. And I get called into the office, and I'm told, based on some decisions that were made over the last few days, we're going to have to let you go. I thought losing 75% of my salary was going to hurt <laughs> Losing 100% of it and not even having a job felt way worse. And I had to go home and tell my wife, I just lost my job. Now what do we do? And so we spent some time talking and praying over the next few days and made a decision, you know what? We really believe God was calling us to do something else. Let's focus on me getting into school and somehow work in this whole career thing beside that. And we'll see what happens. Now I can tell you, losing 75% of your income causes some life changes in your life. The houses you live in, the cars you drive, all that stuff starts to change. But we made a decision. About a month after this, we're struggling, trying to figure some things out. It's not going so well. I'm about to start school in a few weeks, a school that's in another state that I want to take some classes online for. My wife is at a business meeting, and at the business meeting, they announce this new position that's going to be open. And afterward, her district manager goes to her and says, hey, I want you to know that, uh, that, that position that we just talked about, you're not really qualified for it yet, but we believe you're the best person for it. So we want you to know that if you're interested, the job is yours. She was like, oh, really? What's that mean? She's like, well, it's in another state and it's a whole other city. You're going to pick up your family and move if you want the promotion. So she comes home to tell me. But here's the part you can't make up. The promotion was in the same city of the school that I was going to take classes online at. <laughs> a place that we'd never even been to before, neither one of us. She gets her promotion. Her salary increase was the same salary that I lost. A month later, after, after this decision was made, we're now in a new, we're moving to a new city so I can go to school full time and our income is the same as it was six months ago before all this started. This is just God just blowing our minds going, okay, we're gonna step out, we're gonna believe you, we don't know how this is gonna work, but I'm not gonna lean on my own understanding, I'm not gonna figure out what the world says is the best way to do this, I'm gonna trust you and I'm just gonna keep doing what you've said to do and I'm gonna believe somewhere or somehow you're gonna show up and make it work and he does, and he does. And that's a, that's a fun story to share, but there's difficult times that we go through as well. Uh, I told you we were a young, young family, my wife and I, we we're newlyweds and we're very young and we have our beautiful little girl, but we wanted a big family, so we've been wanting to have more kids and we were, you know, year one goes by and year two goes by and year three goes by and we're like, we really want more kids and the doctors are saying we're not gonna have any more kids and year four goes by and year five goes by and you start at this point, okay, God, maybe you don't have it in the cards for us to have a big family or a lot of kids and okay, maybe that's not gonna work out for us. And then in year seven, when my daughter's almost eight years old, we find out that my wife is pregnant. Completely unexpected at this point. We are so excited Man, we are pumped up. We are doing the nursery with every new gadget you've ever seen in your life. Like, we are telling everybody we know, people I've never met before, I'm having another kid. It's going to be awesome. Like, we're so excited. And we're going through the whole pregnancy process. And in month, uh, right, going into, right going into month five, we're, we're doing our checkup with the doctor, and they're, they're doing the sonogram, and they run into some, they're having issues, and they can't find the heartbeat. <laughs> and the nurse calls in the doctor, and they try some other stuff, and he comes back to tell us that we've, we've lost the baby. 
she's going to miscarry. And we have to go home like, we've waited seven years for this. Man, this was, this was supposed to be like our next kid. We had a name picked out. <laughs> like, I mean, we've gone through a lot to get this far. This is, God, what are you doing? How could this happen? And I'll tell you, as hard as it was for me to, to experience that for myself, what was probably even as hard, if not harder for me during that next season of life was watching my wife emotionally go through what that did to her. And we're in this season where I've seen other people take this as what you might call a faith crisis where they just start to question God and say, you know what, God, how could you let this happen? I don't know if I can trust you anymore. Are you even real? And they walk away from God. And we had some decisions to make and some conversations and some prayer to go, is that really where we're at right now? Are we gonna trust God even in spite of how we feel right now? And as hard as it was, maybe a little bit at the time, we decided we're gonna trust God. It doesn't change who he is. Our circumstances don't change because God is who he is. God, we're just gonna keep moving forward with everything you've told us to do. And we're just gonna trust you to give us the strength that we need to get through this. And I will tell you, sometimes it was just enough, but we always had enough to get through. And he always gave the right people in our, in our life at just the right moment to say just the right things as we went through that season. And I, I say this all the time. I don't know how people go through devastating things in life without God in their life. I don't know how you go through stuff without having Jesus to lean on and to have his love and his support and his strength that goes beyond anything else we could do in ourselves. And I'm so glad that we made a decision. We're gonna trust you anyway. And so we did. And a couple months later, we found out my wife was pregnant again. You should be really excited, but for us, it was too soon. <laughs> Instead of being excited, first thing that hit both of us was fear. <laughs> well, what if this doesn't work out again? What if she loses this one too? And, and I remember that, that first week after we found out, we hadn't told anybody yet. And we, we had been talking and praying a little bit over those next days. We decided we were going to have lunch. We actually, actually made a meeting on our calendar to have lunch, and we were going to talk about how we're going to handle the situation. And we prayed leading up to that and said, hey, we're just going to figure this out together. And as we're talking about, do we just want to wait and tell people until we get further into it? Do we want to go and tell people now? Do, how, what? And in that conversation, I told my wife, just as clear as you, whatever it means to hear from God, he said, are you going to live in fear or are you going to trust me? As clear as I think I can understand, that's what I felt in my spirit. And I said, okay, I looked at my wife and I said, I feel like God's saying, are we going to live in fear or are we going to trust him? She goes, I don't want to live in fear. I said, neither do I. So let's just trust him that this baby is going to be absolutely healthy and a joy in our life. And if something does go wrong, and then we're not going to believe that it is, but if it does, he got us through it last time, he'll get us through it again. Man, let's just tell everybody we're pregnant again. We're excited. Let's get the nursery ready. And so we decided to do that. Nine months later, Brady comes along. And when you pray, you should pray very, very specifically. <laughs> because all eight years of waiting for a kid ended up in one, the energy of all those years ended up in one kid. <laughs> Which is awesome. Brady is just incredible, right? A couple months after Brady's born, my wife gets pregnant again. Nine months later comes Ethan. During this two-year process of having two kids, the situation happens with my sister to where my niece needs a place to stay. She was nine years old at the time. She ends up with us. We get custody. We go from one kid to four kids in less than two and a half years. And I was like, God, you can slow down. You can just slow down now. It's a little much. I need you to help me get through this now. <laughs> Whole different situation. But God, when you trust him, when it even doesn't make sense to you sometimes, you got to be still. you got to let go of what you understand and with the strength that you think you have and the wisdom you think you possess and go, God, you are greater than this. And without you, I can't get through this situation. I'll never make it. And that's what it means to be still and know that he's God. And I will tell you, especially when you're trying to live your life to follow Jesus, sometimes it gets really hard. And one of the realities for that is because there's an enemy of God who is the enemy of anyone who is trying to follow Jesus and he looks for every opportunity he can to punch you in the mouth. Every chance he gets, he wants to punch you right in the mouth and get you off track of what God says is the best for your life. John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes to only steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the purpose of the thief. The purpose of God's enemy is to steal, kill, and destroy. His only 
purpose is to steal your joy and to take away your peace. He wants to kill all hope you have of the life that God has for you. He wants to destroy the plan that God has for your life. That's his purpose. But Jesus said, I came. He says, I came because his plan for us is that we would live fully alive. That's why we talk about this community church because that's what we're about because that's what God is about. He says, I want you to live fully alive. Yes, that's his purpose. I came so you could have life and have it to the fullest. He says, I know. And John, he says, I know in this world you're going to have trouble. I'm not saying it's always going to work out. You're going to have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Don't forget what we read in Jeremiah and Isaiah. I'm the God who spread out the heavens and the skies because I chose to. I'm the one that created the earth with my own wisdom. I'm the one that is unsearchable in my knowledge and understanding. I am the one who came so that you could have life and have it to the full regardless of what you may be going through because I am greater than whatever it is you're facing. So when the thief comes and punches you in the mouth, if you would just let go of what you think is going to make sense, trust me, I'm going to get you through it because that's who Jesus is and that's what he promises to do. And it changes everything. It changes everything. And yet there are so many people who get stuck right where they are because of fear and because of doubt. And instead of moving forward, they just stay in that place. They just stay in that place. And God says, that's not what I want for you. I'm a resource for your life. Here's the interesting thing about being still, because when we're going through stuff, I mean, if you ask anybody, they'll say, if I can just get through this, I just got to get through this. We all want to get through it. Can I help you understand this if you're taking notes? The best way to keep going is to be still. The only way you're going to keep going in life is when you learn to let go and trust Jesus. You're not going to move forward apart from him. He's the one that's going to get you through that. He's the one that's going to give you the the rest that you need, the strength that you need, the hope you need, the wisdom you need, the encouragement that you need in life. He's the one that can do that. If you want to move forward in that tough situation in your life, then let go of thinking you can do this and say, God, help me. And he will show up and he'll provide a way. I, I had this image in my mind as I was getting ready for this message from something years ago, some of you, a lot of you will remember Hurricane Katrina, devastating hurricane storm that hit New Orleans years ago now. And I remember uh, not long after that storm hit, I was reading some things online. I ran, this, I ran across this article that has really stuck with me ever since. I've seen it. And so it's one of those articles that a couple weeks after the storm had hit where, where it was just this picture of part of the downtown area where everything was pretty much just like leveled and rubble. From, from the winds and the storms. And of course, this is after all the water finally receded and went away. And you don't see really anything as if there's one structure in the middle of the picture. The way they took the pictures is one small structure in the middle of everything else that's pretty much leveled. And the article was an interview with the bank manager because the one structure that was still standing was a vault to a local bank. And they were interviewing this bank manager going, what is it, what, what's the deal with this vault that, that y'all have? The whole building collapsed and went down, but this thing is still here and nothing else is, exists around it. And he went on to say, he goes, well, when we came here and we built this bank, he says, we knew that there was issues with flooding and the levees breaking here and all those kind of things. We knew it was a hurricane risk and all that. And we knew that the things inside of this vault were so important, we had to make sure that they were taken care of. So we decided to build a whole separate foundation for this vault, for this, for this safe, than the, even what the rest of the building was on. Because we know flooding was an issue, we did a special seal on it to make sure that even if it did flood, if it was completely underwater, nothing inside would get ruined. He says, we didn't know at the time it would actually work, but we did it a whole lot different. While everybody else was doing something the way they've always done it, they decided to think about it differently. And when the storm was over and the winds had stopped and the waters receded, the only thing left standing was the bank in the same condition it was before the storm ever hit, still serving its purpose, still standing strong, still on its foundation, still having everything inside of it perfectly as it was before the storm ever came. And it's always been a great image to me that if we could just get ourselves anchored in Jesus, the same way that safe was, if we could just trust God enough to go, no matter what is going on in my life, I'm going to believe you more than anything else. I can promise you when you get punched in the mouth from life, when it feels like the, warms, the waters are coming up and the earths are quaking and the mountains are crumbling and the sea is roaring and all these things are happening, life is chaos, it's gone sideways, everything's upside down. When it's all said and done and the dust settles, you will still be left standing because Jesus never fails. And when you're standing there and everything else around you looks like chaos, 
chaos, you'll be like, man, I'm so glad I trusted him and not me or anything else. Not only is that a cool thing, but here's what takes notice. Why was there an article on this? Because it stood out among everything else. You know one of the greatest things you can do is when you root yourself in Jesus and trust in him and he gets you through things in life, you know people will take notice because they'll go through the same stuff and go, how did you do that? They'll say, why are you still left standing? You're like, I didn't think I did anything special. I was just trusting Jesus. What did you do? I trusted in me. Well, I don't think that worked out for you. (laughs) Be still. Let go. Trust in God. Proverbs 3, 5, 8 says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on on your own understanding, seek his will in all you do. He will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord, turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Can I tell you that when you're going through a difficult moment in life, what you believe will determine how you come out of it. What you believe in the moment that you're going through it will determine how you come out of that situation. And if you believe that you have the strength and the wisdom and the ability to get you through it, then that's the result you're gonna get. But if you believe God has the strength and the wisdom and the ability to get you through it, then you're gonna see a greater result than you ever imagined. Because that's who he is. And that's what he does. We're gonna go through stuff. I'm so glad that God's shown me things in my life already to help build my faith and encourage me when I go through things because it's gonna come at us. There's times, God, Jesus said, in this world, you're gonna have trouble. I'm in a situation now, a few days before Christmas, I got a phone call. My dad had been fighting cancer for a few years. He was cancer-free for about a year and a half, but he was still kind of physically struggling. I got a phone call a few days before Christmas when my dad passed away this past Christmas. And that's a, that's a, that's a whole difficult thing to go through on its own, emotional thing, but what's been the hardest about it right now is watching my mom who was married for almost 50 years to a man that's not there anymore. To watch my mom who's in a situation where dad's money is what kept her going, his pension, and with him passing away, a lot of her finances have changed. And not only has she lost her husband of almost 50 years, she's losing her house that she's had with her husband for for years. And she's gonna have to lose her house and downsize from a three-bedroom place to an apartment. And not only is she losing her husband and and her house, but all of her stuff, (laughs) And it's been hard on her. And I've had to watch her go through this. And, and we don't know where she's going to live yet. We're trying to figure it out. We don't know how much income she's going to have to even have a place. And so I've been going down. She lives in North Carolina and, and trying to visit with her every chance I get just to kind of help her pack and think through some things and work on her finances. And I was down there about a month ago. One of the days I was just going to kind of check on her and help her do some things. And, and I walk in and I look over and I see one of my nieces sitting on the couch and she's six years old. And I haven't seen my niece in about three, four years because as I said earlier, I already have custody of one of my nieces because my sister was going through some stuff and, and she's been going through a lot of things ever since that time about 10 years ago. And I look over and I see my other niece sitting on the couch and I'm like, hey, what's, what's Kayla doing here? Where's she, where did she come from? She goes, uh, yeah, your sister just randomly showed up the other day. Didn't know she was coming to town. I hadn't heard from her in, in months. I was like, oh, so where's she at now? She goes, well, she showed up, her and Michaela, uh, and then about two hours later, the cop showed up and they arrested her and took her to jail. I don't know what's going on with her. I just know she's in jail right now. Well, what's going on with Michaela? She goes, I don't know. She's just staying with me because I don't know what else to do with her. So she's in a home. She's trying to pack up and figure out how she's going to keep. She doesn't know where she's going to live. Her husband's been gone for the last six months. She has no, almost no income. And now she has her granddaughter who's six years old at her house and she has no idea what's going on with her mom. I said, well, at least for right now, let us take her back to our house and we'll give her a place to stay and we'll help figure some things out. Here's what I'd love to tell you. Here's how all that's turned out. But I have none of those answers right now. This is one of those moments in life where where my wife and I are going through some things. We're trying to figure out how do I help my mom in this season of life? How do I help my sister in this season of life? How do I help my niece in this season of life? And I don't have a lot of answers. I don't have many answers at all, to be honest with you. It's a season of of prayer and and truly just day by day, doing exactly what I'm telling you today that I don't know. I'm not smart enough. I'm not capable. I'm just gonna trust God. I'm just gonna keep doing what he's told me to do each and every day of my life. And I'm just gonna believe that he's gonna help figure it out. And he's gonna show up in ways that I don't understand. Because nine years ago, the same situation happened with my niece, Allison. 
And I had the same questions. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know what we're, what's going to happen with her. What's, and we ended up with custody and all these things. And, and we just took it as it came. We said, okay, God, we just need you to show up. We're just going to keep doing what you've called us to do. We're going to love you. We're going to love our family. We're going to love people. We're going to share your love and your hope because that's what we know you've called us to do. We're going to trust you with the rest. And my niece has been with me for the last nine years, and it's been an incredible time of, my, of our lives. And, and she's as much of my daughter as my daughter Emily is. We got to watch both of them walk across the stage for graduation a couple weeks ago. I mean, just getting to see experience in life that nine years ago I would never have thought was even possible. I don't know how it's all going to turn out. Here's what I know. I'm going to keep trusting God. I'm going to keep trusting God. And when all of it is said and done, however long that may be, what I do know is true is I'll still be left standing when it's all said and done. And he's going to show up in ways that I didn't know was possible. That's what's going to happen. What I believe is true is that even while I'm going through stuff, I can still be who God's called me to be. I can still be who he said I should be and have the life that he told me I should have and do the things that he's called me to do. I can still be that person because I know who he is. And you can write this down. To still be happens when you learn to be still. To still be all that God intended for you to be when he created you. Because in Psalm 46, it can sound discouraging. But here's what it says at the beginning of the psalm. Actually, in, in verse 1, it starts out this way. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when the earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. And he's saying, you know what? Things are going to come your way. But when you get to a place where you truly trust in Jesus and you know what he's capable of, there'll be times in your life where you can actually stand tall and go, well, bring it on because I know it might be hard, but I'm going to get through this because I got Jesus on my side and this ain't going to stop me. I can still be who God's called me to be. I wrote this down and I believe this is for some of you in the room right now. There's some things I wrote down that you can still be. I need you to believe that you can still be when you're trusting in God no matter what you're going through. You can still be hopeful. You can still be loving. You can still be faithful. You can still be joyful. You can still be kind. You can still be patient. You can still be useful. You can still be peaceful and you can still be strong. You can still be sure that Jesus will not fail you and you can still be sure that he is not done with your life yet. That's what you can still be when you learn to trust him more than anything else. It changes everything. I don't know your stories. He does. And he knows the answer to each and every one of them. Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, Ephesians 3, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And I want to read this to you with this idea of no matter what we may go through in life, God is who he says he is and I can trust on him. And here's what, here's what Paul writes. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and it will keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. And I've said this, man, this is a great place. You read this passage and you take a mic and you just drop it and you just walk on. Because <laughs> that says it all. That's what God wants for us. That's what he can do in us. Being still is about being, not stillness. It's about being who God's called us to be people who will trust him more than anything else, not about stopping in our tracks. Because when he's involved, things will happen that matter. John 15, 5 says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. You will produce fruit that matters in your life. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Life is gonna punch us in the mouth sometimes. So what do we believe as we're going through it? How are we going to come out of it? If we would be still and know that he is God, let go of our own understanding and our own strength and what the world tells us is best for our life and trust what God says is best for our life truly is best and that he will get us through whatever we face, it changes everything. My prayer for you here today is that if you're here 
You may have gone through some things. You may be going through something right now. There may be something coming in the days ahead. My prayer is that you will get to this place where you go, I can trust me or I can trust Jesus. And I want to trust Jesus. I want to trust him more than anything else. We use the phrase, go all in for Jesus. It means I'm just going to trust him with everything. I'm not going to depend on my own understanding anymore. And I pray there's not a person listening right now that would, that would leave here today without saying, I want that. I want the God of the universe on my side. That is the best thing for my life. Would you close your eyes with me? And in this moment, I just want to ask you, that if that's you, if you're in this moment right now, you're going, I've tried to do it on my own. I've tried to do it on my own strength. I've had my own plans, and maybe they haven't worked out, but I realize I need to trust Jesus more than anything else, and I want to move forward in the life that he has for me. The best that's for me is from him. I would ask with everybody's eyes closed, just as a way of just showing what's going on in your heart, that you would just lift your hand just where you are and say, that's me. I want to trust you, Jesus. I want what you have for my life, and I believe you can help me experience it all. So awesome seeing your hands go up and so many of you respond. You can put your hands down. I want you to pray with me, repeat this prayer. All of you that are already all in, I want you to pray as well that we just declare what's happening in this moment right now. Say this out loud. Say, Jesus, today, I'm deciding to trust you. Thank you for your forgiveness, your love, and your help. I believe you have the best for my life. Thank you that I can be still and know my best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen.